Hello everyone, I'm Jane Hansen and welcome to CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. As a parent, nothing is more important than the health and well-being of your child, especially if your child is facing any health care challenges. Physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech language therapy, and pediatric rehabilitation. How Catholic Health Services can improve your child's quality of life with their compassionate pediatric care. Stay tuned for a wonderful overview of these services on today's episode of Lifestyles. Hello and thanks so much for joining us. Our discussion today, pediatric care. Our first guest today comes to us from Good Samaritan Hospital where she is the pediatrics chair. Dr. Kathy Caronia is here and thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see you. Thank you, thank you for having me. So of course we all feel so much compassion when we know a child is sick or needs some kind of medical attention. So what, what, what are the general things that you really work on in, in, under your, at Good Samaritan Hospital and in general at your center? I mean, what is it that we are looking for with children and helping them? Well, at Good Samaritan, we have a full array of pediatric specialists and hospitalists, uh, community pediatricians who all come together and really work to support the child and the various illnesses that would be specific to pediatrics, as well as supporting the family as a unit. Um, so we really have and run the whole gamut of specialty services and care for the child. So you're talking about everything from heart conditions to um, maybe some sort of chronic illness to injuries. Yes, absolutely. We run the gamut. and We have specialists who really are there to support any illness that a child may be brought in, whether it's through an emergency department, whether it's through an elective need, or just a community pediatrician's uh, thoughts that there may be something wrong and needing help to identify what that may be. Well, when you think about adults versus children, what is the difference in physicians? I mean, what, because they have to deal, A, they have to deal with the patient differently, I'm sure, because of their age. But then secondly, some things you treat differently when they're children. Absolutely. There's different illnesses that may affect a child, and in pediatrics, we run the gamut from those who are born prematurely up in our neonatal intensive care units all the way through, and we, we manage and care for children up until age 21. So we really do need to know a little bit about both, uh, and certainly there are illnesses, uh, needs that will be different for the child than it would be for the older adolescent or even the adult. Population. So what do you think is the difference between what a doctor has to do with a child versus an adult? Um, I, I think that there are varying degrees you need to know about the developmental status, what is normal at the various ages. Uh, what may be normal for a two-year-old uh, may not be normal for a five-year-old. So certainly you need to know those developmental uh, status of the child and, and compare that to what is um, appropriate perhaps for that age and to identify if there are any difficulties or problems uh, associated. When you think about um, kids and illnesses and hospitals, I mean, there have been some tremendous technological changes over the past few years. Do you think it's a much easier time to diagnose if a kid comes in and the, the, you, the doctor, they're probably their, their family doctor, doesn't quite know what's going on, and so they bring the child there. Um, is it so much easier these days to be able to help figure it out? Um, yes, in some ways it certainly is. I think the mainstay still is listening to the parents, uh, identifying what has been going on, working with the pediatrician, and physical examination. And then we add certainly all of these other um, ancillary tests that are now available today that perhaps were not available 20 years ago. And uh, there's varying degrees that do help us to identify and to pinpoint uh, what may be going on with the child. Well, let's talk a little bit about things like um, physical therapy or 
occupational therapy and all that kind of rehabilitation stuff. Has that changed as well and do you offer full services on that? Yes, absolutely. We offer full services both at Good Sam as well as through all of Catholic Health Services and those certainly have changed and they become partners in the care uh, or in our care for the children who have special needs, um, whether they're short-term short pe special needs or longer term. Um, we really depend upon them to bring children up to fulfill their potential. For parents who are watching this today, and they, you know, sometimes as a parent you have a little bit of a suspicion that something isn't right with your child, but when is it important for them to come to you? I think the first is to bring it up to their pediatricians, to identify and have that continuity of care with their pediatrician, um, to work with them to bring up what they think may be wrong, and then to work with them in identifying what the appropriate specialist should be. Um, it may be a subspecialist, or it may be that they do need occupational therapy, physical therapy, uh, or just some supports within the home. So um, first and foremost, certainly, is to work with their pediatrician in, it, in identifying what avenue they should take and who may be the most appropriate to help them. Mm -hmm. And there's there's specialties and subspecialties in almost every field. Yes, absolutely. And for you have them. You have that pretty much covered on staff at Good Sam. Yep, and they are all there for these patients. And how old does a child have to be before re you know any kind of rehab is really effective? Um, basically, we start off certainly in the uh, neonatal intensive care unit. The physical therapists will come in and they will work with those children, uh, and it will continue at home. There's early intervention services uh, that is also part of this whole program, and uh, children as young as a few days old can benefit from physical therapy. Is there anything you're seeing today in the world of child care that you didn't see when you first began your practice? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, for pediatrics, in at probably every service and every specialty, there have been leaps and bounds. Uh, initially, uh, the child was thought of as the little adult, um, and they're really not. Uh, they have special needs. Um, they really do get different illnesses. They need to be treated and approached differently. And uh, certainly the technology that may have started in the adult population um, continues to get smaller and smaller so that we can utilize a lot of what is available in the smallest of babies. And I think we all, when we see a child that's sick, we feel so much more for them versus an adult because they seem, you know, they're so innocent and helpless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, I think that that probably enters a lot into the way in, in which your people respond. Do you, I'm, yes. I'm assuming you have to train staff differently as well. Oh, absolutely. And we have, you know, from the physicians to the nursing staff, we have an entire child life department uh, and division of pediatrics that work uh, really hand in hand to care for these children throughout. It's, uh, it, it takes, I think, special people to dedicate their time and their commitment to the pediatric patient. And it shows um, when we have children going home and blowing kisses, uh, despite <laughs> what we've done to them, uh, and their families really giving hugs and feeling supported. Oh, that's great. So, Dr. Kathy Caronia, thank you so much for being with us today from thank Good you. Samaritan Hospital. And stick around. All right. We're going to take a quick break, but our discussion will continue right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. Joining me now is Dr. Betsy Foxen from Mercy Medical Center. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. So you are involved with the emergency room. I bet you see everything. We do. We do. <laughs> I think one of the questions that parents have all the time is, when do I bring my child to an emergency room? Common question. Um, children are heard all the time and it's not necessarily going to be from 9 to 5 when their doctor's office is open so um, we are open 11 to 11 and if a parent's concerned um, or if their child is acutely ill um, you know we are open and um, happy to see them. So 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. so that's to Correct. accommodate when doctor's offices aren't open and because because they never break an arm you know, on the, when the doctor's office is open, right? Correct. And the doctor's <laughs> office doesn't usually have an x-ray machine either to uh, make that diagnosis. And the doctors, um, the primary care doctors are not usually um, adept at splinting and haven't had a lot of 
experience with orthopedic injuries. Sure. So that would be a good reason to come to our express care. Now, are you, is your express care also on the weekends? Correct, yes. So it's seven Every days day. a week. Seven days a week, 365 days a year. Oh, boy. You must see an awful lot going through those doors. What do you think is one of the most common things that, besides like a, a broken arm or something like that, that, mm -hmm. that people come to the emergency room with with their kids? Oftentimes, especially in the evening, fevers. Um, the child went to school that day and got um, the parents got called to pick their children up from after school to bring them home because they have a fever. Um, Oftentimes, it's upper respiratory infections, um, ear aches, um, sore throats, uh, rashes, um, and all the usual, um, you know, injuries after school sports, that type of thing. So, if somebody, if somebody's child has a rash, when do you know that it should you should come to the emergency room versus not? Uh, good question. Um, if the patient has any other types of complaints, if there's any shortness of breath, if the child has a high fever, um, has a cough, sore throat, um, if there's been an exposure to any, actually an, an, another um, infectious disease that in the, in, in the school that they've heard about, um, that those would be reasons to come. Mm -hmm. And what about things like childhood diseases like measles or chicken pox and, you know, with the vaccine mm -hmm. these days, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that you don't mm -hmm. see as many cases as you used to, but do you see those kind of contagious disease uh, people, patients? Not, you're right, not as often because of the vaccinations, um, but we, it's always in our differential, it's always in the back of our mind. And how do you mm -hmm. keep that patient isolated so that they don't spread the disease at the hospital? That's, that's a good <laughs> question too, it's kind of <laughs> tricky. Um, when they first come into triage, if the nurse is, the triage nurse is, is um, considering that diagnosis or she's concerned, they'll give a call to us and we'll try to see the patient on the side um, so we don't... Um, so there's no opportunity exactly, for them to right. expose Correct. whatever they might have. Correct, we don't expose all the other people in the waiting room. Because sometimes you don't know that that's what a child has and you bring it to, True. to, the, True. You know, to the emergency room and then all of a sudden you could be infecting other people so you have to be very cautious I guess about sure. that. It seems to me that you have to be trained in so many different fields of medicine for being in the emergency room. How on earth do you keep up with all of that? Well, it's a, um, it's a, lifelong, it's a lifelong commitment, um, you know, continuing med medical education, reading, and just, just being at work every day and seeing patients and following up and, um, and sharing stories with other physicians. Um, it's always interesting. Yeah, but, it, but children, you have to treat children a lot differently than you do your regular, like adults, I'm assuming. Um, yes and no. Um, we also do see, you know, a lot of injuries such as the orthopedic injuries. Um, it, actually, x-rays, children's x-rays are a little bit different because their bones haven't fully formed yet and they have like a lot of growth plates. Um, so there are several subtle differences that way. Um, and, you know, as far as um, head injuries go, um, it's a whole other area to, to discuss, but we see that a lot in children, and um, we try to avoid excessive radiation with the use of CAT scans, so it is important to, um, you know, just to, to know what is normal development, what is a normal neurological exam for, at the different ages and the different, um, the different um, developmental stages of the right. children. Right. You just talked about head injury, so, um, and you said that's kind of like a whole other discussion, so talk to me a little bit about that. Um, well, with the advent of kids getting involved in sports younger and younger and, and the AstroTurf that they're using, um, kids are hitting their heads frequently. And there's, um, we're more aware now of the damage that repetitive head injuries can do and how important it is that children are evaluated and kept out of, uh, kept out of those activities that, where they are at risk for re-injury. Mm -hmm. um, um, and if the child is severely hurt, we do have the advantage that we do have a CAT scan um, you have a CAT on, at, right at the facility that we could get that answer. If the child had a loss of consciousness and we were concerned about internal bleeding, we would have that answer. Is that unusual for your emergency room to have a CAT scan? And do, do all of them have that or is that just something Yeah, that's very... pretty standard at this point now across the country. Everybody's got a CAT scanner. Mm -hmm. And But is there, is there anything else that makes your particular emergency room a little more unique, other than, of course, the fact that you're there? Oh. Um, 
to versus other emergency rooms? Well, um, we have we do we are expanding our express care area to cater more to our pediatric population. We're going to have a new um, expanded waiting room that's very family friendly. Uh, we're also going to have a new treatment room um, so that when we need to do lacerations or um, a small little procedure like removal of a foreign body, um, like that. You mean like when so, they swallow coins? Yeah, when they swallow, <laughs> or when they put something in their nose or their ears and right. we need to get them out or they step on a, a piece of glass and they, we need to, to, to retrieve that. Oh boy, well you have a busy life. It must be quite interesting to see what comes through your doors there. I'd love to have a report card one day, just one day, and see what's there. So thank you so much, Dr. Foxen, for being with us today. You're welcome, thank you. We are going to take another break, but don't go anywhere because there is more of CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health right after this break. Welcome back to CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. Our final guest today is Pat Zumpel, the Central Manager from St. Charles Pediatric Outpatient Rehabilitation. Long title. As we speak about physical therapy and other such things for young children, welcome. So happy you're here with us. Thank you. You have a big job to deal with all these kids when they're, when they're brought in to, for some kind of rehabilitation. What kinds of things would bring a child to your centers? Uh, the children come in our center for delays, developmental delays, gross motor, fine motor, speech delays. We have babies that come with diagnosis of torticollis. We have some children that come post-injury, whether they've been in a car accident, have a TBI, or whether just break their leg and they need to have therapy afterwards. What was that you said about the babies? What was the... It's called torticollis, mm -hmm. and we're seeing a lot of babies with torticollis. It's basically what happens is they have tightness in one muscle in their neck, which causes them to tilt their head to one side, and it develops all postural asymmetries. So what we're trying to work on is to improve their alignment so they're not developing other problems, which could be like flattening of the skull, gross motor delays. So we work co closely with the families on trying to get them to improve their range of motion. You can actually do physical therapy with babies? Oh, yes. We start some days. I've had babies a couple days old that have come in for therapy. Wow. It, oh. mm -hmm. well, I guess they don't talk back to you, but they, they don't talk, cry. But they do cry. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you, I mean, what do you attribute to that? Because you say you're seeing, seeing a lot more of that these days. Well, over the years, we've seen more just because of the back to sleep, that babies are sleeping on their back as opposed to tummy sleepers, which probably a lot of us did when we were little guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, parents are not putting their babies on their tummy as much to play, so they're not developing the strength and the control against gravity. Wow. So um, well, you, that, I'm sure you, that a part of that also has to be working with the parents because they're going to have to continue this on a regular basis because they can't bring a, a baby in every day. Correct. The parents are very involved in the treatment programs. All physical therapy and OT and speech in our center is one-on-one, -on -one, so the patients are always with the patient uh, with the with the therapist and the families are involved. We're having them hands-on, practicing some of the activities. Uh -huh. And so the family becomes, it's, it's almost as if your centers are really, they're all about the family, the whole unit. Correct. The whole unit is there. So when, um, when children come in for such things as, you know, simple breaks or some, something that's, you know, an injury that will heal pretty quickly on its own as kids are pretty resilient, what kind of therapies do you do with them? Well, the whole key of working with children is we just can't do say, okay, go over there and do 10 exercises of this and, you know, 15 of that. We have to make it fun because it's, it's scary for them and it has to be challenging and rewarding. So all our activities, our goal is to improve, say, range and strength, but we're doing it in a fun way. We're getting them on bicycles, on scooters, playing different games. They don't realize they're working, and they are. <laughs> they're working hard, and they don't realize how hard they're working to achieve the goal. But that's great. It's too bad adults can't do that because they're equally not as interested in doing, you know, just road exercises, even though we understand the value of it. Do you ever, what happens when a kid won't do things? It's challenging, but we just try to like divert them, try to give them reward system. Some children, we use a reward system. If we do this, then we'll get to pick a toy at the end that you'd like to play with. Mm -hmm. And speaking of your center, we had the opportunity to tour the Pediatric Outpatient Rehabilitation Center at St. Charles Hospital. Let's take a look now at the amenities offered to your patients and their families. 
Catholic Health Services of Long Island knows the importance of providing quality care to the children of Long Island. Here at St. Charles Hospital, we have a uh, multi-service PT, OT, and speech therapy for our children. Um, and our children can be from as young as birth to 21 years of age. Uh, we provide one-on-one -on -one services to the children. We encourage the family to be a part of the activities um, with the children so that they can carry over the activities at home. Being its children, it can't be just traditional exercise programs. We have to make it fun. So it's fun activities. We do challenging things. We do obstacle courses, scooters, balance beams, ball activities. In OT, when they're doing some of the sensory input, they'll have the kids play with the shaving cream on the mirror. They'll do um, handwriting skills, fine motor activities. Uh, speech therapy works on trying to improve communication. It could be as simple as just a child that's stuttering or a child that has articulation problems or it could be a child that doesn't have any communication skills at all and they'll use adaptive assistive devices. Um, we're going to be getting some iPads soon so they're going to be able to use some apps from that so that'll be exciting for the children. Um, also, they work on feeding. Some children um, have difficulties with feedings because of either sensory input or oral motor uh, delays. And the th uh, speech therapist works along with the OT to try to improve some of the quality of that and that they improve their eating skills. It's a fun job because you see them in the hall, they just, they brighten up your day because, you know, they're just so excited. They don't even realize how hard they're working because really they're just having fun. So it's, it's a fun activity. The therapists love it and, um, and the children do too. Having a happy atmosphere and a fun activity definitely improves the speed of recovery, just the participation alone with the children so that they will more actively participate and just be a better part of the team. It actually looks like fun over there. It is a lot of fun. Now, that's just one of your um, centers. You have a lot of them. Right. We have eight network sites to begin with, and the site that you just saw was the main campus in Port Jefferson. We do pediatric physical therapy at four other locations in Ronkonkoma, Patchog, Melville, and Smithtown, and we also do pediatric occupational therapy at the uh, site in Patchog. So if, um, if a child it needs this kind of therapy, I'm assuming that you will try to make it as close geographically as possible to home. Yes, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Now, is, are the costs of this covered by insurance usually? Yes. Most of it is covered by insurance. Sometimes it's not, and the parents will opt to private pay. You talked a little bit about the speech therapy. What mm -hmm. kind of speech therapy do you do, and what's that consist of with kids? Right. For speech therapy, they're working on oral motor dysfunction, so whether children have feeding issues and or like language problems, expressive, receptive. Um, some of the children are just developmentally delayed in that area, just delayed talkers, and others are because of an injury. Are you seeing anything more today than you of something that you haven't seen in the past. I'm just, I'm curious about how things might have changed in, the, in that whole world of pediatric rehabilitation. We are seeing more patients, like we had said before about the torticollis. We definitely see more babies that are getting therapy. And I think parents and uh, physicians are just more in tune to delays and the schools are picking it up that the children might have, say, handwriting delays for OT, other sensory issues, and they're picking it up and referring their children to therapy. What's the difference between, I know this sounds like a really silly question, but between occupational therapy and physical therapy? Occupational is more about the motor skills, writing skills? In, in, in pediatrics, PT and OT have a lot of overlap, um, but we're really working on the developmental aspects of the children, whereas PT does more gross motor activities, jumping, hopping, skipping, whereas OT works more on the fine motor, the grasp, the handwriting, the upper body control, self-care activities, dressing, you know, children have problems with dressing and zippering and things like that. Mm -hmm. Do you, with, with kids who might have some kind of a chronic illness, do you, do you also treat them? Sure. Mm -hmm. Like what, what would be a case of that? Um, some children with cerebral palsy, that's, you know, a condition that they're born with, that they basically, you know, have deficits and we work on trying to improve their function. That's mm -hmm. And how do you know, um, I mean, you get, obviously a pediatrician r refers um, the patient to you guys, but, but um, is that just a pretty simple process of somebody saying, we believe that this would really help you? Do they come in for assessments first? I mean, how do you figure out what to do with them? Right. Well, we always do an evaluation, a full evaluation on each child on their first visit. And we set up their areas of need and set up goals and treatment plans based on that. I'm going to invite Dr. Caroni and Dr. Foxen to come back in and join us now because we're just about to wrap up. And, and what I really wanted to see, if there's any kind of last words, because the, the, the message I'm getting here is that there's a whole team effort.
somebody has to come to the emergency room, and then ultimately you might see them, and then they're going to go over to Pat because they need some kind of physical therapy. So how important is that whole team? I think it really is. Uh, then that's uh, the chair of a child as well as their family really does take a team effort. And from the point of the first diagnosis all the way through to the treatment plan really needs to be a cohesive treatment team that works together with the family to ensure that children will reach their potential. Because again, a kid, they can't really take care of themselves like an adult can. So you have to treat them differently and deal with this differently. Are parents always eager to be involved or is that ever an issue? It, it does depend. I mean, it depends upon the family situation. So for anybody watching out there right now, what kind of advice would you give to them about if their child does need care, how do they do that? I think, again, work with the community pediatrician, uh, work with the resources that potentially they can support, and continue to be an advocate for your child. Um, if you think something's wrong, continue to bring that up to the forefront and um, get people who are well-trained and comfortable dealing with the child. Um, not every doctor is comfortable with children, and you want to make sure that they are all well trained in the care of uh, the smallest of children. Yeah, well, and you guys clearly are comfortable working with kids. So thank you so much for joining thank us you. today. We really appreciate it, and keep up the good work. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Um, so we've had some great information that we've learned about today about the health of our children, and of course, the knowledge of where to go for the best care possible. You can always get more information or schedule an appointment at one of Catholic Health Services' six outstanding hospitals. So call one eight five five C H S. 4500 or visit the website chsli.org for more information on the Good Samaritan Pediatric Center, Mercy Medical Center Pediatrics Express Care, or St. Charles Pediatric Outpatient Rehabilitation Programs. As always, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jane Hansen wishing you goodbye and good health.